Okay, so to illustrate this concept of supply and demand, I had you play um, that paperclip simulation prior to the lectures here that hopefully it was enjoyable. Um, when I had discovered this a few years ago, I ended up spending like an entire day playing the dang game. Um, and it was, it was fun, um, but it was very, very time consuming. Um, and so paperclips, they're fun. Um, I, I wonder, many of you may have not gotten to this point. This is what it looks like if you finish the game um, and you go beyond just changing the number of paper clips you're making and changing the number of um, uh, production um, factories that you're using and other, other things that you can tinker with. You end up getting into this whole game theory world here. You start exploring the galaxy um, and the universe and you're creating all sorts of things and it, it's nuts. Um, so I doubt you got to this point. If you did, awesome. Um, I did not get to this point. This is a screenshot from Reddit where somebody actually did do it and they somehow did it in four hours and 44 minutes. So good job them. Um, but the whole reason I had you do this is because in the early stages of the simulation here, um, all you really have power over is how many clips you're making and the price that you're setting. Um, and hopefully as you played around with the simulation, you discovered that if the price was too low, you ran out of paper clips really quick. And if the price was too high, um, you never sold any paper clips and you started running out of money. And so the whole point of this early simulation is to get you to lower the prices and raise the, um, raise your manufacturing and tinker with those, those different levers until you hit kind of a good level of profit. And then as you start changing that, you try to increase demand, you try to get more people to buy stuff. Um, that's the point of, of advertising and other things that you were able to do um, to get people to want your stuff more so that you could sell more and gain more profits. And so in the early stage of this game, this, this represents kind of a real live simulated market here where you can adjust things and hopefully sell more and hopefully increase profits, um, which is kind of a, a fun little thing that you can do. Um, I also had you read about this um, fun adventure on Amazon where two different books ended up costing more than $2 million. Um, and part of that is because they just had competing bots. Um, each of these, these different um, sellers um, priced their books based on the prices of other things. Um, and so it just has a script that runs and checks to see what the other prices are and then kind of raises the price or lowers the price depending on how competitive they wanna be. And the two scripts kind of got way out of sync and ended up just boosting each other until they were trying to sell this book about fly genetics um, for $2 million. And so this is a good example of what happens when markets go totally wrong and the prices that are supposed to be signals of scarcity um, just don't work anymore. And so they eventually had to go back and, and change the prices manually back down to a reasonable price instead of $2 million for a book um, down to like $30, which is far better than $2 million. Um, but it's a good example, again, of, of prices um, and how, how prices change and how the demand responds to those changes in prices. Nobody actually bought these things because they were way too expensive. Um, you've also seen this, this dynamic of supply and demand um, back in the very first couple sessions of this class. I mentioned that um, when I do this class in person, we do a simulation where people in the class um, are split between people with black cards and red cards. And the people with black cards are sellers. Um, they have to sell a paperclip to somebody in the class. And the number on their card is the lowest price they can sell for, or the, the highest price they can sell for. Um, the lowest price they can sell for. And so they have to go out and they have to find somebody that's willing to buy one of their paperclips for some amount. And so if you are in this 10 range, you have to find somebody who's willing to pay $10 for your paperclip and good luck with that. Um, the other half of the class has red cards and these are buyers and this is essentially their budget. Um, if you have a 10, you can pay up to $10 to buy a paperclip. Um, if you have a two or a three or a four, good luck. You don't have a lot to find somebody to trade um, and to get the paperclip and so it's really hard. Um, in this simulation, what we ended up doing was um, people would go out into the world and try to find a trade. And then based on the imbalance in the numbers here, so if a nine ran into a two, for instance, and they decided to trade for $6, um, they got bonus points depending on how good of a deal that was. And so this nine person would get three bonus points because it was $3 higher than the $6 price that they decided to hit. 
and the two person would get four bonus points because um, it's four dollars below um, that price that they came to. And so there was this concept of bonus points and people would get candy based on how many bonus points they got. And so you were trying to find the best deal um, out in the world. And what ended up happening in every simulation where I've done this in person and other people have done this, um, this is a common economic simulation, is the price generally settles on one value. In this case, it settles on six. Sometimes it might be five, sometimes it might be seven, but it's gonna hover around six and pretty much everybody's going to hit that price um, magically by themselves. And that is, we've talked about this before, this is because of the invisible hand, it's just because of the dynamics of the, the people's budgets and the people's uh, willingness to sell stuff. Um, that kind of uh, collides at six here because of, of who's in the market here, um, which is a really cool thing to see out in the world. Um, and so this is a more graphical version of, of the results of these simulations where you have this demand from the sellers or from the buyers and you have supply from the sellers and then they meet somewhere here at about $6 and that's where they're making their, their general prices out in the world. Um, so the reason we, I do this in person and we've talked about this in a couple sessions here is because it reflects what happens in real life. Um, there are people out there that want to buy stuff and they are demanding something and these are called consumers. They are you when you go to the store, you want to buy stuff. Um, and so this is what creates the demand for something. And so in this graph here, we have um, two different axes. We have the x-axis shows the quantity of books. This is a book market here. Um, and so there are a whole bunch of people that are willing to buy books up to a certain level. So there's a whole bunch of people, 40 people are willing to buy books at a really cheap price, like a dollar per book. Tons of people are willing to do that. If you go over here, this price is really high and there aren't a ton of people that are willing to buy a book at $20. So this line here is called the demand curve. It's based on something called willingness to pay or WTP here. Um, another official term for it is the marginal benefit. It's the extra benefit you get from getting one additional book. Um, and this is something that is measurable out in the world. It's, it's the actual demand for things. Um, and so it's basically everybody's budgets. It's, it's what people are willing to pay for stuff. Um, from the supply side, this is also a real thing. You have some sellers who are willing to pay or willing to sell um, at a really low price. And you have a ton of sellers, pretty much everybody is willing to sell at like $20 a book. They would love to do that. Um, but they can't because um, they'll start losing money um, because their cost structure makes it so they can't actually sell for that expensive. And so um, they have to meet somewhere here in the middle here. And where these two things cross is what emerges as the price out in the market um, based on what all of the different buyers or demanders want and what all of the different suppliers or sellers want. And based on their willingness to pay and their willingness to sell or their willingness to accept, that is the, the market price that emerges right here. Um, and this is, again, the invisible hand. This just kind of happens out in the world. And the cool thing about this is if a seller comes into the market and says, um, so let's say this, is, this looks like it's about $8-ish, I would guess. Um, so if a seller comes in and says that they want to um, sell a book for $6, they're going to sell it really quick, um, but then they're going to run out of books. And so it's naturally going to go back up to eight so they don't run out of books. If a seller comes into the market and says, I want to sell my books for $12, nobody's going to come to them because they can get the same books for $8. And so that more expensive seller is going to have to lower that price down to eight and pretty much all the prices in the market are going to have to settle around $8 and they're gonna sell about 24-ish books is what that looks like there. Um, and that's kind of a brief overview of how this works. Um, the other cool thing about this is these are lines, which means we can do math with them. Um, we can find equations for these lines and there's economic researchers that spend their whole lives just trying to use statistics to figure out the equations for different lines out in the world because these again are real numbers here. Um, and so if you can find the equation for a demand curve and the equation for a supply curve, you can set them equal to each other and find the exact place where they cross. Um, in economics, they love using P and Q here. P stands for price and Q stands for quantity. 
um, in graphs, the Q goes on the x-axis um, and P goes on the y-axis. And so the cool thing about this is if you remember the formula for a line, it's y equals mx plus b. It, this is the same thing. You have y, p is y equals some slope times x or q plus the intercept. And the nice thing about that is you can actually plug these things into Desmos because it's y equals something x plus something. And you can find exactly where they cross in Desmos. So if we put these two equations here, this negative 0.5q plus 20 and the 0.25q plus 2, we can find exactly where they cross in using Desmos. So let's switch over to the Desmos really quick. And here's what that graph looks like. Here's our demand, which is sloping down. And here's our supply that's going up. And they cross right here at 24 and 8. So that means 24 books will be sold in this market and they will be sold for $8 each um, because of the structure of the demand that exists in the world and because of the suppliers and how much, their willingness, how much they're willing to sell their books for. And so based on both of those two real world things, this is what is called the market equilibrium or the clearing price or where the two lines intersect. And so that's basically how you do it. So now we're going to talk briefly more in detail how um, you can actually find these demand curves and these supply curves in the real world using real data.